what's being worked on now is 3D bioprinting, um, where you can use what's called bioink, and you can actually print tissue. And definitely by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be able to use 3D bioprinters to regrow organs. Uh, so, so that'll be a really amazing breakthrough, I think. And it's, it's, it sounds like science fiction, but all this stuff is already happening in clinical trials and in animal studies. Um, so it's just like a pretty predictable roadmap to see where it's going to be in like the, by 2030. Dr. Adil Khan, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, can you give a brief description about what it is you do and who you are? Yeah. So uh, I'm a regenerative medicine doctor. Uh, so what I do is I treat people using stem cells and plasma technology. Uh, so instead of trying to get people better through drugs and surgery, uh, we try to repair their tissue back to a natural state um, or previous state before the injury. Um, that's my main specialty. But now, because regenerative medicine, as we'll go into, has evolved so much, um, it's not just treating pain and injuries anymore. That's what I started traditionally, but now it's evolved into so much more. And I'm doing like clinical trials in different areas and using uh, stem cells for like a broad range of applications. Okay. This is very cool. Who's your who's your average client, do you think, or patient? Well, uh, it ranges from, you know, like I've had literally like, you know, moms who couldn't pick up their kids and were in so much pain and they couldn't function um, all the way up to like the richest man in Dubai and uh, who built the whole city uh, or, you know, some of the rulers of, this, of these kingdoms and stuff like that. So it really does range. And uh, the reason is because there are, you know, billions of people living in, in chronic pain, actually. Um, and and then there's also like a lot of people who are just looking for anti-aging and longevity. And so there's such a broad scope of application of what we do. Um, and, you know, the cool thing is with the, obviously with the elite um, kind of community and like the elite sports athletes and the billionaires and stuff like that, they all want to do this to help them stay younger, potentially live longer, prevent injuries and all sorts of stuff. Okay. I have so many questions. Uh, I think I think the first question uh, like what exactly is a stem cell? Yeah, so I think when people think of stem cells, they usually think of like the baby, right? Like like this stem cell thing that comes from a baby and that can maybe help to repair tissue. Like most people have probably heard of like umbilical cord stem cells where it's like, you know, after you give birth, they can store it or they can freeze it. And then, yeah. so it's like, why do they freeze it, right? What's that, what's the point of that? Um, and so obviously even 20 years, they started doing it like 20 years ago. Um, there was a reason and the reason was because there was this promise that maybe we can use these stem cells one day to help heal tissue. Um, and back then we thought that you can only use your own child's stem cell. Uh, but the whole idea of the stem cell was basically it can help to regenerate or repair damaged tissue. Um, and so the concept of repairing tissue is very exciting because instead of having to cut things out or instead of having to take drugs to uh, manage symptoms, you can actually repair mm -hmm. tissue. You can actually repair tissue. So it's very exciting. And but there was a lot of controversy back in like the mid 2000s and like uh, late 90s because there's there was something called embryonic stem cells, which is where they actually make like a fetus. Um, and then so you make it in like a petri like in a test tube, and then you literally take the stem cells from the the embryo and then you the, the embryo basically dies right and so obviously that was very controversial ah. and so that's why yeah and that's why there was so much like heat about it. like a lot of people and things except they're like oh are babies being harmed like are you harming babies and yeah like that and so it's it's not like that at all anymore because obviously that's unethical and no one is using embryonic stem cells uh we're primarily using umbilical core stem cells but there are different types of stem cells for, like you can even get them from your bone marrow from your uh from your fat um, just so people understand, there's like two broad categories. There's adult stem cells, and then there's what's called perinatal stem cells. So perinatal is pretty obvious, right? It's like all the tissue that comes after birth. So that's like placenta, amniotic fluid, umbilical cord tissue, and umbilical cord blood. Hmm. So there's all these products that usually that used to just get thrown away, but now we don't throw them away. We actually collect them, we manufacture, we isolate the stem cells, and then we can, um, you know, we d literally we distribute and sell them, and we inject them and use them for all sorts of things. Whoa! So that comes. To, that's not just the umbilical cord. That's the placenta as well. Yeah. So that's actually wow. that's one of our uh, best products. is It's called purified amniotic fluid. Um, so it's the fluid from that's from the amniotic like sac, obviously, and then you you isolate the exosomes, um, and the exosomes are like these little messenger cells that decrease inflammation and help with aging, uh, oxidative stress, and all these markers of aging. So a lot of people use it just for anti aging. Uh, Tony Robbins wrote a book about it, and just like he's been promoting it a lot, um, and he's like he's actually like you know whatever. Uh, 
people who uses the product and like people like that just they do it every six months just for uh, anti-aging and longevity purposes. Okay, and what exactly are they doing? Yeah, so what happens, so there's there's seven or eight hallmarks of aging. So as we age, there's a lot of different reasons why we age. Uh, I won't go into all of them, but basically one of the main reasons why we age is stem cell exhaustion. So what that means is when you're, when you're a child, you have about 200 million stem cells per cell. And then by the time you're 80 years old, you only have like Eight, you only have like 1 million stem cells per cell. So if the, the, okay. you're going from like, you're going from like 200 down to like one, basically from like, from maybe to like 80. And so it's called stem cell exhaustion. So basically when you, your body's stores of stem cells get depleted, you don't have the same regenerative capacity, obviously, um, and your ability to fight infection, immune system, lots of different, because stem cells have so many different roles, your ability to regenerate and repair tissue, DNA damage, fight off infection, fight off cancer, all that stuff just decreases because one of the reasons is you don't have as many stem cells. Um, so now hmm. we can do what are called intravenous stem cells. So they go IV. And they go through your whole body and they help to replenish those stem cell stores. So that's what all like the, you know, oh. and so that's what I would say all the wealthy people are doing now. Basically, if you have the money, you're going to do it because it can help you live longer and there's no downside. <laughs> so, Hey, you guys may have heard me talk about better fed beef. Huge news for those with histamine intolerance or who can't tolerate aged meat. So it kind of upsets your stomach when you eat it. They have unaged beef available to you now. This is extremely hard to come by. So check it out because their stock is limited. If you don't know about Better Fed, or you haven't heard me talk about them, their certified Anya beef is a game changer. Not only is it incredibly tender and consistent, but a recent study by North Dakota State University, no idea how they ran this study, found it to be as tender as American Wagyu, but at a fraction of the price. Better Fed beef is made up of 17 Midwest farm families who raise and care for the cattle and are also owners in the business. These families use specialized diets designed by PhD ruminant nutritionists. That's what they're doing at universities, ruminant nutritionists, and control all aspects of the production process from genetic selection to nutrition and animal care. Visit betterfedbeef.com and use the promo code MP at checkout for 20% off your first order, which is huge. Not sure how they're making money with the 20% off coupon code thing anyway it's huge so you can get unaged or aged meat for 20 percent off your first order betterfedbeef.com real beef from real families okay okay so let's get into that then have there actually been any long-term studies on it prolonging aging there's biomarkers. no i guess prolonging life you don't want to prolong aging exactly yeah exactly prolonging like delaying, life. yeah improving quality of life and uh delaying um aging or slowing down aging so um yeah so yes yeah, basically there's what's called biomarkers. Uh, so you've probably heard of like, tele most people have heard of like telomere length, which is like, you know, one of the biomarkers of aging. And then there, but there's so many other, like in, there's inflammatory markers and there's a lot of other ways you can measure aging. Uh, and those those markers of aging do decrease. Uh, and there is a lot of data on that with intravenous stem cells. Is there long-term data saying, hey, if you take IV stem cells, you're gonna live 20 years longer? Not yet. Uh, but in, in mice, there is definitely life extension data with the uh, IV stem cells and, um, and that. What? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't actually know. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, okay. really cool. Because, okay. Yeah, because I mean, there's so much, um, you know, excitement in the anti-aging community uh, because of the stem cell research. But it's also in combination with other treatments that we're doing, um, which, you know, one of the things I, I like to uh, mention is just it, it's something a bit related. But have you heard about like the fecal microbial transplants, FMT? Yeah. So that, I have, but but get into it for anyone who hasn't. Yeah, no, in mice, in mice, they actually showed when you take healthy young poop, literally from like a healthy young mice and put it into old mice who are, who are on the end stage of their life, it can actually extend the lifespan of the old mice. So it's pretty cool. Um, so there's actually life extension. That's crazy. Because, and if you think about it, the stem cells are a similar principle. You're replacing the ecosystem, right? Why, why does your whole body's health improve when you're just taking someone's poop and putting it in your colon? Right. It's like because like what what is that? Like why is it's because the ecosystem that it provides. It's a good bacteria, the signals it sends. And we know that the gut communicates with almost every organ in your system. There's like the gut brain access, the gut disc access, which means like your back, gut joint access, like your joints, there's gut lung access. The point is that there's a gut 
communicates with your whole body. And so if you have a healthy gut, it, it creates a healthy ecosystem. And similarly, when you replenish these stem cells, it's creating a healthy ecosystem that's getting depleted. And that's and, it's so, and it also helps to obviously repair the gut lining, reduce inflammation and all that too. Wow. Okay. Do they have sketchy clinics offering stem cells? Like places that pump you full of things that aren't stem cells, but it's like the cheaper price and people are there. Anytime. And the regenerative medicine is uh, riddled with uh, snake oil salesmen. Um, and unfortunately, yeah. even if you're a medical doctor, it doesn't mean you're necessarily qualified to do the stuff because there's no real, like, there's no real faculty saying I'm a regenerative medicine doctor. You know what I mean? It's not like, um, and so that's the problem. There's like very poor regulation because it's a new field. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, we're working on. Like I've, I've partnered with Dr. Ian White, who's a Harvard scientist. Um, and, he, you know, and he's one of my uh, partners because uh, because of his experience and like 20 years of experience. But I get to learn from him so much. Uh, and and then, we're you know, we're part of the American College of Regenerative Medicine. And um, so, we, you know, there are hmm. things you can look for like, but at the end of the day, it's really hard for like the average person to know if this is a good stem cell clinic or not. Um, I think the only way to honestly know is like you have to really go by like credibility in terms of like who are the doctors like who are they associated with are they working with the scientists what are their quality control measures like are they measuring like their stem cell profiles like there are certain things you can look into but I feel like the average consumer wouldn't know how to do that like unless obviously they and that's why we're doing this right to educate people yeah yeah I've I heard about because I have people DM me whatever has worked for their autoimmunity constantly and i had one person dm me that who had a five-year-old with very severe arthritis and she's also using diet to treat it but they went to panama and they did stem cell injections they didn't do an infusion but they did injections um and said that her flare-ups have lessened so yeah yeah and but then think, panama sounds so like sketchy yeah and panama is yeah unfortunately there's poor regulation there but there is a clinic there that's been doing it a while but the problem is it's not that it's the doctors there too right most of the doctors there aren't working with scientists and like they're just doing um like they're kind of just made up their own stuff i would say uh and so i would say look into the doctor see if they're affiliated with some sort of institution like and see if they're working with mm -hmm. the scientists like i think you have to have a scientist like the the if you don't have a scientist you're like who's um high level like you just can't keep up with the field you know okay I think that that makes sense uh and then are there any downsides or do you just get infusions of pure stem cells yeah and then that's it you just feel better there's like no one has an alert like there's nothing to be allergic to or anything no that's a cool thing so when stem cells like first started people were like oh you have to use like your kid stem cells or it has to be from your yeah. family member or whatever uh but now we can because we can isolate what's called the mesenchymal stem cell like so that's like a pure stem cell oh. uh, so there's no what's called hla antigen so there's no chance of having reaction or immune response. So you can just, I could I could even take your stem cells and put them into my body and there wouldn't be any reaction. Uh, but the point is- Oh, that seems like a terrible idea. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so if you have health issues, it's probably not a good idea, but but that's why, that's why <laughs> we do a lot of strict uh, testing and um, just criteria and stuff on who can donate. Um, like with the umbilical cord stem cells, for example, uh, like the products that we use, our company um, is I, I, the Dr. Ian White's company. It, we we don't um, we actually don't accept um, if they've been vaccinated right now. We still don't accept uh, like the donor. Whoa! Is there a reason that you don't take from vaccinated people? There is some research suggesting that you can trigger what's called a spike protein in the stem cells. Um, and that spike protein may trigger oh. other sort of immune response in the body and cause inflammation and potentially make things like cause things to get worse. Um, it, it, there's some data on it, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's hundred percent clear, uh, but given that there might be a potential risk, we are only taking, at least our products um, are just from unvaccinated women and um, donors. Wow. Okay. And so these donors aren't, there isn't like a camp in China that's consistently keeping people pregnant and stealing their placentas, right? For rich people to infuse. There probably is, but who knows? But who knows, <laughs> who knows what they do in China? But in, uh, in, in the U.S., though, uh, no. But uh, but yes, that's, that's I mean, that is, uh, I guess, one of the ethical things. It's like, yeah, definitely it's an expensive treatment and um, only a very few percentage of the population have access to it right now. So that's, that's wild. Okay, so how much... Uh, Say, how often would you need to do one of these infusions to see, like, how long does this benefit last? And then how much does that cost? Yeah. So if you're doing like IV exosomes, which are, so just so people understand. So um, 
stem cells and exosomes are two similar products, but they are different. So it's important to understand. So like if you have like if you have like chicken soup, right? The 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 chicken part is like the stem cells, like that's the nucleus and it has everything. And then the soup, which has the nutrients, is like the exosomes. So it still has all the nutrients in there, but there's no cells in there. So because there's no cells, it's not going to reprogram your immune system or have any as long-lasting ah. benefits. So the exosomes are something you typically have to do every six months, um, sometimes maybe every year to get benefits uh, versus stem cell infusions. Uh, you can do every two to three years typically for anti-aging and longevity. But if you're doing it for like autoimmune conditions or osteoarthritis or like chronic inflammation, fibromyalgia, stuff like that. I mean, sometimes people, like a lot of my patients, we treat it like they only need one treatment and uh, we combine it with peptides and, uh, and they're typically they're good to go. Peptides. Peptides and stem cells. Really? And then they're good to go? So yeah. do they, this is very interesting. I'm going to have to try this. I've tried so many things. And if I could get more into my diet, I doubt that that can happen that way. But who knows? Um, do the stem cells go in, let's say, for people with autoimmunity and actually start you again, like in an unbroken way? Have you seen that happen? They just retrain it. It's like, oh, something went wrong the first time, but here we'll try again. So it's like, how does that work? Yeah. So it's, it's what's called immunomodulatory. So it's basically, it is reprogramming your immune system over time. Wow. And so that's why it has long lasting benefits. It's the immunomodulatory component. And, and so, but like we talked about earlier, the gut and like, you know, gut, leaky gut syndrome or intestinal permeability, as it's called, um, that's a component of autoimmunity as well. And the stem cells also help to repair the gut lining. So that's why it has such a strong immune benefit um, and because of the reducing inflammation and the immunomodulatory benefit. But, and that's why I'm, what we're, my autoimmune protocol now is using IV stem cells with, with pe uh, peptides, which we can talk about in a sec, and the FMT together, because then you're targeting all yeah, the components great. of the immune system. So you're targeting the thymus gland, which is an important part of your immune system, using the peptides, and then you're using the IV stem cells to reduce inflammation, heal the gut lining, and then you're using the FMT to obviously help with the whole gut issues and the immune component from that. Hmm. Okay, let's do, um, so with with FMT, I've, I've tried that. I did a lot of research into that, and, and I went to a good, uh, I can't remember what the clinic was called. It's a good clinic. There's one in the UK. There used to be one in Canada that shut down um, during COVID. And then there was one in the, Tay Mount. It was called Tay Mount. I went to Tay Mount. Um, and it like didn't work at all. And But I mean, they tell you reintroduce foods and like, you know, so that your microbiome has something to eat and I'm just eating meat. And so maybe that was part of it. But I ended up um, getting really, I had a C. difficile infection and it wasn't like antibiotics weren't ha happening, helping. And um, I found this protocol online where you double encapsulate the sample and swallow it so that it hits the small intestine and not the colon. And that cured my C. difficile in one treatment. Wow. And so that was interesting. And that was after I went to Tame Out and it didn't work like, cause they sent me home with samples too, to do myself. I don't know if people are, Anyway, it, it happened. I tried it. I've tried everything to like reduce sensitivities, which is what you do when you're ill. Um, plus, I miss lettuce and things. So anyway, that fixed it. So when you do FMT, do you just focus on the colon or do you ever hit the small intestine? Uh, typically, yeah, we're doing it through a colonoscopy. Uh, but it is interesting to know uh, that an option orally exists that can penetrate your small intestine too. So yeah, really cool. Yeah, yeah, I'll um I'll link that study in, in case anybody's interested, and I'll I'll send it to you because it yeah, like well, it's it worked. I could it. add to the protocol, right? Like I'm always about stacking as many pathways as possible to, especially with autoimmunity because it's so complex. And if you're not gonna, mm -hmm. and and that's the problem with most conventional medicine, it's very reductionistic. Um, they try to take it down to like one thing and be like, take this pill because this will solve all your problems. But it's it's not that simple as we know now. No. No, and, and probably a number of things have to go wrong in order for autoimmunity to happen. Exactly. So you might have to tackle things from, like, like I've tackled things from a diet perspective, and that's put me in remission, but, like, I'm stuck. It seems like I'm stuck here. Yeah. My assumption was I was going to heal my gut with the diet and then reintroduce things with less of a reaction, but I seem yeah, to just be might, stuck on the diet, need, so. You might need that immunomodulatory reprogramming. Yeah. Yeah the IV stem cells and the peptides could do. So so maybe maybe we'll get you to come down to uh, Los Cabos or Dubai or somewhere where we can do it for you. <laughs> but Definitely. Wow. 
have a stem cell party. Okay, peptides. What, uh, what, what do peptides do? And what are their names of, or, or yeah. some of their names? So, I mean, the most famous peptide, obviously, is like insulin. Like, everyone's heard of that. So, that gives people like an idea. Oh, okay, insulin's a peptide. Um, but what, oh, okay. what is it really, right? It's, it's basically like a baby protein. Um, so, what that means is it basically sends a signal to your body to do something. So, it's, very, it's a very general term, but it's essentially a very specific signal. So, insulin obviously gives a signal to say, shuttle in more sugar take it away from the bloodstream and put it into cells. So it'll lower your blood sugar, right? So that's how insulin works. It's a very specific peptide, has a signal, and that's what it does. And so, but now we have designer peptides, meaning you can get, you can have different peptides that do different things. So I think one of the most famous ones, because of TikTok really, is uh, Ozempic, uh, the weight loss peptide. Um, it kind of became- Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it like basically yeah. sold out everywhere in, the, in the North America because all these- uh, influencers were promoting it for weight loss and then it's just like but it's a but it's a peptide it's a glp1 peptide which is basically a signal in your gut that makes you feel more full and it helps with insulin sensitivity and stuff like that um so there's so peptides are becoming more and more popular because there's a lot of benefits and pretty much like again like minimal risk or almost no downside and so the peptides we use for the immune system we we're talking about earlier is the thymus gland and so it's called the thymusin beta 1 and thymusin beta 4 um, and so TB1 or TB4 as their short, short name. Um, but basically what they do is they can help with atrophy as the thymus gland, which is what happens as you get older. But obviously that's more in like, I would say 56 year olds um, as, who get who develop immune autoimmune conditions. And then younger people, again, it can have that uh, immunomodulatory effect uh, on the thymus gland and helping to reprogram that immune system and changing it from like a pro-inflammatory state to more of an anti-inflammatory type of state. That's so interesting. It's crazy that you could isolate stem cells from like a, a placenta and umbilical cord. Like, so basically back when you barely existed, you go back to that state and regenerate. Yeah. Kind of. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that, it, that's cool. It's really cool because it's like, it's like you're literally taking healthy young cells or tissue and you're putting it through your body. Uh, and it's like, who doesn't want to feel younger or like look younger or like feel better and stuff. Right. It's like, um, and, and like we said earlier, like there's pretty much no doubt. Oh, okay. So then <laughs> all those like wackos on the internet that are encapsulating their placentas or like, I don't know what they're doing, eating them or putting them on their face or something oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> and saying that there are massive benefits. What do you think about that? Could that be stem cell related? Is there anything, any truth there? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't advise eating your placenta for many reasons but the, i feel like lots of people do I know, it i know i didn't do it problem, i was like that is too far but yeah the the problem is it's like there's so much other tissue there and you're not isolating what you need to isolate it's like the same thing with fat stem cells and that's the problem with these in, in clinics in the u.s they're they're like they're like we're offering stem cell injections they're not really stem cell injections because they're just taking your fat or your bone marrow and they're processing it and they're injecting it back in but it's mixed in with so many other things you have to actually isolate the stem cells and then in a lab you have to manufacture them or expand them and grow them and then you can get the full benefits from it so if you just eat the placenta yes maybe there's some growth factors and some stem cells in there but you're also going to have so much other stuff that you don't really want in your body so there's going to be uh there's going to be downsides of that and that's a problem with this whole field in general like i, I feel like a lot of people need to understand that nuance that a, to get a true stem cell or or exosome you, you do need a manufacturing and like lab facility to process mm -hmm. that you can't just go to if some clinic is telling you they can do stem cell injections they're, and they're just taking it from your own body those aren't true stem cells those are just like more anti-inflammatory signals that um the technical term is progenitor cell uh which means it can send signals that reduce inflammation but it's not going to regrow new tissue hmm okay that's all very good to know wow this is crazy um i think you posted something on instagram the other day that said don't do botox do this <laughs> Yeah, no, I got, what were you referring to I got, there? I got 100 messages from women being like, please, please help me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what know? is this magical thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I look so tired right now because it's like 12 a.m. in Dubai. But, uh, but usually, I, usually I look better than this. But you, it, with the stem, I had a stem cell facial. You look good. The, the stem cell facial, um, what it does is it helps to regenerate tissue um, and it helps to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. So the reason you're, you get wrinkles and you get like those eight signs of aging on your face um, are three main reasons, uh, inflammation, oxidative stress, um, and then uh, impaired ability for collagen synthesis, which means you can't regrow that collagen as much and you don't, and then that's why you lose that elasticity and tightness in the skin. Um, and so Botox, 
obviously, but it, it's a neurotoxin. So basically it paralyzes the muscle so you don't move it. Uh, but what it does over time is it does impair blood flow. Um, so meaning the muscles can become weaker actually. And then so you, you have to basically keep doing it or else eventually you're actually going to look worse than you did before you did the Botox. Um, and that's what, what? Everyone, and that's what everyone gets in the trap. I don't want to hear this. Like, uh, well, you do both. I don't know if you, I uh, guess <laughs> well, anyway, but that's, but when no, no, I do. I, I do. I like, and I have, um, at but, least right here for a while, but that's the thing. Now you, you're either a lifelong customer or you have to find a different solution. Um, so, and that's why Allergan, the company that makes Botox actually approached us because they want us, our product, our exosome product to get into spas because, Whoa. because it can, it can fight those signs of aging. Um, and it's a natural alternative to, and it, instead of just masking it, you're actually trying to repair tissue and you're getting to the, yeah. to the root cause. Um, so using stem cells and exosomes together for the face, um, can help with actually regenerating tissue as well as reducing signs of aging. Um, and you can combine it like what they do at the Mexico clinic. So if, if you end up coming down there, we can do it for you is they, they combine it with radio frequency, which is like a, it's a Korean technology that helps to tighten the skin. Um, so they use all three, they use, and that helps with collagen synthesis. So it's really cool. So they do all, they do all three together, the stem cells, the exosomes and the radio frequency. And it's like, they're kind of like, Los Cabos, uh, regenerative medicine, like facial package that they offer. So, Hey, this episode was sponsored by NordVPN. As someone who travels a lot, I was always worried about using public Wi-Fi and exposing my personal information. That's why I turned to NordVPN. No, it's not. I wrote this ad with chat GPT. Is that cheating? That's not why I turned to NordVPN. It's a good reason. NordVPN does keep your personal information safe, but I turned to NordVPN to download movies without going to jail. Now I'm talking about it. Anyway, back to the ad. Not only has NordVPN kept my data secure while I'm on the go, which it has, but I've also been able to access content that might not be available in my current location. That did happen. I used it in Serbia to get to Disney. Serbians don't like Disney. I don't know about Serbians, but the government doesn't like Disney. Weird. Anyway, it's been a game changer for me. If you're looking for a reliable and secure VPN service, which you should just have turned on on your computer, look no further. NordVPN is the best option out there. It's what I use. With NordVPN, you can browse the internet safely and securely no matter where you are. And right now, you can grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com TMPP, which is the acronym for my podcast, to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus a bonus gift. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And if that wasn't enough, NordVPN also has a free anti-malware feature to keep your device safe from any unwanted threats. Again, head to nordvpn.com TMPP or use promo code TMPP to get a huge discount off their premium plan and take advantage of their free anti-malware feature and the ability to access Netflix from different countries and download movies. That's so cool. Okay. I'm definitely going to do that. I'll try that. Maybe I'll put it on YouTube so people can see. Yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. That's way better. I mean, any any type of regeneration is better than a toxin, well, like, obviously. Look at breast, like, I just, I mean, now we're talking about cosmetics. Like, I'm in Dubai right now, and, like, there's, a there's like, a cosmetic clinic. Everybody has every a boob job. And, like, yeah, but... Yeah. But you know what we're doing at our clinic, our plastic surgeons now, because of breast implants, all these studies coming about like, you know, cancer and breast illness, yeah. breast implant illness syndrome and chronic pain and all these issues. So a lot of women don't want breast implants anymore, and especially the younger generation. Um, and so what we offer is we actually offer um, using fat graft, which is your body's own fat with stem cells. And that can actually take, it can increase your breast size without, Whoa. and it's natural. Um, so a lot of women are doing that at our clinic now, and it's, it's breast augmentation um, using regenerative uh, treatments. So I think that's the way that is things are going to go. Such a better idea. That's such a better idea. Yeah, boob jobs are so, like from from everything I've read too, and uh, like obviously such a bad idea. Yeah, but again, the the industry, the medical, <laughs> these industries are all the same, right? Same playbooks. They get into the doctors, they use their information, and they they get they make billions of dollars. And even if they get sued or whatever, they're still up you know, billions of dollars because they get, they made 20, they get sued for five and they're still off 15. Um, so that's, that's just a playbook. The pharmaceutical companies. Oh, that's terrible. A lot of the medical device companies have had for, for years. Yeah. 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 That's no good. Okay. So how much do these things cost? Like how much is one of these infusions or are there different like levels? Yeah. You only get infused a little bit. Levels. It's less. And yeah. Cause exosomes are definitely cheaper. They're usually like, um, like 5,000 us dollars to 10,000. 
whereas the IV stem cell treatment is usually for, for like the anti-aging protocol or autoimmune pro protocol, it's usually between 20 to 30,000 US. And uh, so, so obviously, you know, it's not going to be like something that someone has read, like everyone has readily available, but for people like, like pro athletes and a lot of, um, you know, the wealthier people who want to fight off aging for them, it's something they do routinely because there's no downside and there's so much upside. Jeez. Um, but I do think, yeah. but, but why is it so expensive, right? It's, it's because the, to isolate the stem cells and to grow them, um, it's called cell stem cell manufacturing. The process is still expensive, but it's come down, like it used to cost like 50,000, just like uh, five years ago. Um, so it's come down by almost half. Mm. And, and so I, I always say the analogy is similar to like electric vehicle batteries. Like it used to cost like $400 per kilowatt per hour to make like a, a Tesla battery and now it costs a hundred dollars. So it's gone down, down by like four, four X over the last 10 years. And the stem cell manufacturing, there's innovation happening in terms of how to manufacture those stem cells. So it will become cheaper. Cool. And so it's going to go, instead of being like 20,000, I can see it in the next five years, go down to like 10,000. Mm -hmm. Um, and then hopefully from there five years then to 5,000, right? And then, then it becomes more yeah. accessible to the average person. Okay. Okay. Very cool. And then what about one of those anti-aging facials? What will that cost you? Uh, yeah, that's like two to 3,000, I believe. Yeah. So it's not bad considering like um, it's something you don't have to do all the time. It's usually, it results usually last like a, like several years um, and something. That, oh. Yeah. So it's not like one of those things you have to do, like, because Botox, most people have to do like every like three to six months, right? And is it something you have to go like be sedated or anything for, or no, is it just, just numbing, like it's just numbing? numbing. Exactly. Wow. That's wild. Okay. That's cool. I'm glad I've had you on and know about that. Yeah. Now. If there's one benefit you got from this. <laughs> this podcast is just, it's just about people I want to learn from anyway. Yeah. So whole... this is good. Oh, okay. I heard this conspiracy. What do you think about this? It's a conspiracy theory, but I believe it. Um, that, when when COVID happened, um, a bunch of leaders in the Communist Party who were old, like in their 90s, uh, died, like in a pretty short period of time. And um, apparently they were, <laughs> I don't know if this has anything to do with you, but uh, they were being kept alive because they were getting organ transplants repeatedly. Have you heard about, like, do you think that that, and I'm not suggesting people do that because that's immoral in many ways, but do you think that would actually work? Is that just a conspiracy theory? Or if you put younger organs into people, would they live longer? I mean, theoretically they would, right? Yeah, but doing organ transplants is like a big undertaking. And if you're in your- Dangerous. 80s, and then you have to take immune suppressants, right? Exactly. And if you're in the 80s and 90s, it's not a- it, it, what, What's much more likely is they were probably getting fecal microbial transplants and IV stem cells from young babies and uh, getting those to help them live longer. That's that's a much more probable uh, explanation as to how to live, how to- prevent from dying like at that age. Um, but, you know, w with what's being worked on now is 3D bioprinting, um, where you can use what's called bio ink, and you can actually print tissue. Um, and so it's not we're not far off, like, I, definitely by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be able to use 3D bioprinters to regrow organs. Uh, so so that'll be a really amazing breakthrough, I think. And it's, it's, it sounds like science fiction, but all the stuff is already happening in clinical trials and in animal studies. Um, so it's just like a pretty predictable roadmap to see where it's going to be in like the by 2030. I was born too early. I did a bunch of I ha I've had my ankle replaced and that surgery is just not good. Like they're pretty good at knees. They're pretty good at hips. I at least in meant, Canada, I they're not very good at ankles. When did you get your ankle replaced? 2007 and I was 17. So the surgeon oh, yeah. was like, I'm like I was in university. not super comfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's too bad. Back then, the technology wasn't there yet. But now <laughs> now what we can do if you, if you were to have or someone out there has like the same issue and they want to avoid surgery is we can actually um, use expanded stem cells. So the stem cells that we grow in a lab for three to four weeks, and then you can actually use a 3D bioprinter and you can print a custom scaffold. And then you can seed the stem cells with the custom scaffold and then you resurface the entire joint and re you regrow cartilage. That's that is a, that's I'm like irritated, <laughs> but that's so good. That's so good. What are you supposed to do? Like, when are they going to be able to regrow a foot? I need a new foot. Yeah, exactly. Now we can. We, the, we're, we're not. <laughs> we're there. University of Washington. His name is Farshad Galiak. He's doing an FDA approved clinical trial right now using that 3D bioprinter technology. Uh, but we're going to be. Uh, my company is going to be acquiring that and providing in Mexico in two years probably. So. Okay, so that's crazy. This is wild. Um, why are you guys in, you're in Dubai now, you're in Mexico. 
Are you guys in America or do you have yeah. to travel outside of America for this? Well, yeah, the, uh, America is like a very interesting um, environment politically because the FDA, just to give people an idea, 70% um, of their uh, donations uh, come from pharmaceutical companies. And so, mm -hmm. so they inherently have uh, lobbyists who want to promote pharmaceuticals and don't want stem cell technology to take off. And so they're trying to regulate stem cells like, wow. like it's a drug. And so they're basically making it they're almost actually they're cracking down a lot. So anyone doing stem cells has to be really careful in the U.S. Um, a lot of them can get malpractice and get in trouble. Um, but there's still a lot of people doing it. But there has been a lot of cases recently where doctors even lost their license. So to me, it's not worth the risk. Like even though we're going to be opening up a new facility um, with the Florida Panthers in uh, the in the summer, and so we will be operating out of Florida, but we'll only be able to offer like the first generation of like stem cells, which is what I talked about earlier, where we take the fat or the bone marrow. So they're not true stem cells. They're more just reducing inflammation, which can still help. But like, to be honest, like I could, most of my patients, like they're okay flying over to Las Cabos or Caymans or somewhere. And we just do it over there, you know? So what does the average person do for anti-aging that doesn't have like 20 K to drop on infusions every couple of years? <laughs> well, it's a or are they just going to be like old and ugly and it's, that's just life is hard. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. My, um, and people around me have been saying you're going to create like an unethical society with because we're working on gene editing too and so it's like what if what if because you can eventually edit genes to choose selective and you know eventually it's you can basically make offspring that would be superior genetically right um so it's not like these things are all going to happen and there's going to be a lot of ethical things around there it's like are you creating a superior society where people have access to certain technology medical technology that other people don't um and it's going to widen the gap. yes it's going, to, it's going to widen the gap that's already so widened um so I don't I don't have a good answer to that, but I do say that like the fundamentals are still the fundamentals. Um, so, you you know, learning how to put on muscle, like sleep, exercise, uh, nutrition, stress management and like meditation, like those are at the end of the day are still the most important things. Um, and if, yeah. like I'm a, I'm a huge fan of muscle uh, because muscle releases something called myokines. Uh, myokines are cytokines. So they're like protein messengers that go throughout your whole body. Um, so they go into the brain, they fight off Alzheimer's, dementia, they go into the heart to prevent heart disease, they help with insulin sensitivity, to prevent diabetes. Um, they do what's called increase oncosuppressor genes, so they prevent cancer. Um, so there's all these cool benefits myokines have. Um, so or, so I always say like, and, and and this was Dr. Gabrielle Lyon who coined the term, but like a muscle is like the organ of longevity. So muscle is really the key to longevity and if you're not strong and if you don't have that strength your uh, frailty and chance of dying younger are much higher so that's actually the best predictor we have right now uh, of longevity is muscle okay that's good there isn't yet like a, a, a magical pill or something that only well, billionaires so can afford. What we're making, this sounds pretty much. Well, what we're making is we're going to make, um, <laughs> we're, we're making designer exosomes. So we're going to have a muscle derived exosome and we're also have a, and we also have a gene therapy um, called follow statin. It's, it's actually really cool. So um, it's, it's a company in Honduras or doing a clinical trial right now. But um, so have you heard of myostatin? Yeah. So yeah, myostatin is basically, it's, it's kind of like this enzyme that blocks how much muscle you can put on. So if you have a myostatin deficiency, which like some pro bodybuilders do, or if you look up on Google myostatin deficiency, you'll see these humongous cows with so much muscle because they don't have a capacity. Yeah, that's why I know of myostatin. It's from the cows. Yes, exactly. Those muscular yeah. cows because they have a yeah. deficiency so they can put on unlimited muscle. So there's actually this new therapy that it's, a, it's an injection and it basically inhibits myostatin um, for about a year and a half. And so it allows you to put on a lot more muscle. Um, so it's really exciting. So I'm going to, I'm going to get it done on myself. Actually. Um, I'm excited to do it, but uh, it's going to be cool. What, how, so is, does that give you like, well, that's way better than taking steroids, exactly. right? It's way safer because it's just, and it's not in your system forever. Um, and it's all it's doing is sending a signal similar to how peptides do to turn off this, uh, signal to the enzyme and, um, it's temporary. There's a, like no documented side effects and, um, yeah, it's a really cool technology. So I'm excited to it on myself but i know they've already, they're doing a clinical trial for muscular dystrophy right now um so it's really oh, exciting that's so cool wait does that mean if you had atrophied mu muscles so that that's that's atrophied mm -hmm. muscles right yeah oh my gosh oh i could use that in my leg my yeah. like, so calf then, we, can, we can just when you can get lost cobbles, we're just gonna do everything on you you can get the full yeah okay full that, makeover. <laughs> sweet that sounds good yeah, that or I or <laughs> that sounds a lot faster than waiting for someone to regrow a foot. Yeah. So, <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Okay, okay. Um, 
What do you think about red light therapy? Does any of that like matter yeah, I, slash work? Yeah, no, I, I actually um, like, you know, I, even though I'm into all the like, you know, basic stuff, I still think there's other things you can do on top of the basics to fight off aging and signs of aging. And red light therapy is one of the things I use to help with like skin aging and stuff like that. Like I've, I've never done Botox or anything like that. And I, I mean, for, I don't compare to people in my, like I'm in my uh, mid thirties, like most people my age have a lot more wrinkles I've seen and stuff like that. And I think part of the reason is because I use red light, but red light therapy can also help you with sleep. Um, there's actually this cool new um, intranasal LED, red light therapy you can use at nighttime um, and helps to go and then intranasal nasally because it helps to relax your brain and helps you helps you to fall asleep and stuff wow that's cool okay i need to look into that too this has been very informative wow interesting okay um let's talk about prp a little bit you use because you said you work with platelets right yeah so prp is a technology that was developed like almost 30 years ago now um so it was where you know we literally just took your blood we put it in a centrifuge, we isolated the plasma, and the plasma has something called platelets. And so when you centrifuge it, it concentrates those platelets. And platelets are little messengers, um, basically, that send signals to your body to help facilitate regeneration. So what it was used for, the claim to fame for PRP was really to help injuries and sports athletes get back to the field faster. So it's like, you know, they tore a hamstring or they injured their calf or something. And instead of having to wait like four to six weeks with physio and stuff like that, you could inject them with PRP and they'd be back in like two to three weeks or even less sometimes. Yeah. Um, and so that's what made it really famous. And, and still to date, we use PRP a lot for those acute sports injuries. Um, but I do feel like it is an older technology now because as, as with anything, um, technology keeps evolving, right? And so PR, ah. PRP was one of those things I use a lot of in the last like five, like, you know, I use so much of it that I used to promote all the time and I, I still use it, but now that stem cells and exosome technology is really taking off, it's almost like, it's kind of like providing old technology for at least for like chronic medical conditions. You know what I mean? Like if it's a, if it's like a acute muscle tear, I have a pro athlete, like I, you know, I had an initial guy just a couple of weeks ago, he, he tore his adductor. He's a, he's a multi-million dollar contract. So for him, every week makes a difference, right? So for him, like doing PRP makes sense getting back fast as possible. Right. Um, but for like, unless you're like, you know, you're, you have an acute injury. Um, I don't really see the application as much because chron for chronic tendon issues, chronic osteoarthritis, it's just stem cells work so much better. Like they have longer lasting results, uh, better data behind them. And the safety profile is the same. Like there's no risk with PRP or with stem cells. Okay. But it's way cheaper to do PRP. Yes. And there's still and some so, benefit. And that's the exactly. And that's the big, I think the main reason I do PRP now for like someone with osteoarthritis is, is just simply because they can't afford stem cells. Usually that's the usually why. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, that covers a lot of what I wanted to talk to you about. I mean, I have, I've got way more questions here, but I mostly wanted to know about stem cells and if there were any downsides because when, um, when dad had so akathisia, and that was being caused because he was on medications that were causing it. So there wasn't really any regenerative thing we could do to counteract what was actively happening, unfortunately. But we were in Florida and and now I like and and I was looking up everything. I was like, NAD, we should talk about NAD of what you think about it anyway. I was looking at NAD, I was looking at exosome therapy, I was just like, I was looking at hyperbaric oxygen, I was like, just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah could work, nothing like helped at all until the medications that were causing it were removed. Yeah. Like nothing helped at all. Yeah. But um, what do you think about NAD and hyperbaric oxygen? Is there anything there? Yeah, no. Um, so our anti-aging protocol that we have in um, Los Cabos, we do use hyperbaric oxygen uh, with it as well, because it has, again, it's a slightly different mechanism. And um, oxygenation does have, uh, like, especially the, the guy in Israel who likes, he started like the Aviv clinics, and he's like the kind of the pioneer of hyperbaric oxygen. Um, and he has, he's the one who published a study showing that it can have longevity benefits, but also help with like, um, cognitive impairment. So it can help with brain regeneration. And it worked, in my experience, it works synergistically with the stem cells because it's it just, it, it's promoting an environment that's going to help your body to recover and heal. Um, so I'm, I'm a fan of it with other treatments, like as a standalone, I don't think it's usually enough for most things. Um, but as an adjunct to other things, I think it can, can be helpful. Um, and same thing with NAD, like I think NAD, um, it depends on what you're trying to use it for. If you're just trying to use it for like more energy and stuff, 
uh, I think for that, it can be great. Just so people, a lot of people might not know what NAD is. Um, it's kind of like this molecule that help, it's, it's, it's in your mitochondria, um, which is like the powerhouse uh, for, to go back to like high school science. And so basically what happens is that it just helps to replenish those uh, stores in the mitochondria um, and it helps with a process called oxidative phosphorylation, which is like the process that helps to produce more energy. Um, and so it basically makes energy more available to your body. Um, and so when you uh, replenish any when you get older your NAD stores deplete and so it's just helping to replenish those uh, and so you have to typically you have to do any any IV drips uh, fairly like uh, consistently to see the benefits um, at least that's what I've seen clinically and um, but there are these new cool options too like some people are using NAD um, like patches NAD suppositories um, so they can use them on the go and like in different situations so I think it's becoming more accessible in that situation did, did they like I, so um when it, when dad was sick, anything that like I tested, I tested on myself first to make sure it wasn't going to do something weird. And NAD, I was like, that could do something weird. Um, is it always just awful? Like whenever I've had, I've had NAD infusions now in three different, three different people. And they're like this big bag and you're hooked to an IV and it's like a five to seven hour thing, unless you can like tolerate it better. And it makes me like, it's like being hooked to like a battery it's, i'm like not a little nauseous like a battery and just like yeah my arms are heavy and it like hurts and then i i had to get up and use the bathroom and i and i'm kind of like you know out of it because of the the infusion and i turned it up instead of turning it down oh. <laughs> to like st yeah and then it was just like i'm about to die anyway i got it back down is it always like you're being hooked to a battery or but Am I people, like a wimp? No, no, you're not. It's just it, there's um, individual like response. Uh, like some people, like when I had it, I literally felt nothing. But then there, I have a lot of patients that describe it just like, yeah, exactly like you do. And so um, I think that sends that's that's probably other things going on. And that's why you have to like and that's why you have to really get to the root cause. Why is your body reacting that way? Right. And so you're oh. there's obviously things going on in your body um, underlying maybe like um, you know, in terms of like immune dysfunction and whatnot that are probably increasing your risk of having that type of response to it. Oh, okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, anyway, I did it a bunch of times. And too. there's also like one off, but like, like um, there's different concoctions you can combine with NAD to help like mitigate those things. So, um, so maybe if we like, if you ever want to do it, we, I mean, it, we can try a different protocol. But I don't know if it sounds like you've had some bad experiences with it, so it's probably not worth it. I feel like I the did, IV, these, I I think like these the were... IV stem cells would give you enough of energy benefit um, because it does give you more energy too. Um, and people feel like, like I literally had one NHL player. He was 35 years old. He was thinking about retiring. And uh, about six months after he had the IV treatment done, he said he felt like he was 25 again and he's going to keep playing. So it was pretty, like, that was That's a, crazy. a dramatic example, but it's, like, amazing. To, like, clinic, like anecdotally, just to see that is amazing. That's so cool. Definitely going to get my dad on this and my mom after, like, cancer and everything. Yeah, exactly. That's very... Yeah. And yeah. the cool thing about I just, I, I, cancer, I was just going to say, is that um, the microenvironment that allows cancer to happen, if you think about it, is the same underlying mechanisms, right? Is chronic inflammation is like the number one reason. Um, and so if you, and the, the IV stem cells are going to create a microenvironment that are going to reduce inflammation and help to fight that off. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I never actually thought, I, I just assumed my like response to NAD was because NAD is horrible. <laughs> it's like, I can't imagine you have a like a you patch or a suppository and just, yeah, you definitely have oh. some sort of immune dysfunction, which is why I think because you have a sensitivity to it, like some stuff too, right? And so, so I think that's it's just, just a few things. Just a few things, yeah. So there's definitely some immune dysfunction component. That's why um, I'm excited to do some treatments for you with the peptides instead. Okay, because it'll reprogram your immune system basically. Wow, I don't know. You're talking a big talk here. We'll see. <laughs> I've only that'd be I've only, done I mean, here, like... I've only done it once or twice, so. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been in regenerative medicine and why did you decide well regenerative medicine is like the coolest thing you could be doing as a doctor so yeah that's probably why you decided to go into <laughs> it much. but yeah what what's the backstory a little no, bit uh, honestly like i think i think most people like i mean your dad's a clinical psychologist too like why do we become doctors it's usually because it's pretty simple it's like we want to help people um but like at, there's so much um, almost like disbelief at the conventional medical system for me. Uh, I was 
I was just kind of like a lot of patients weren't getting better. I was like, why are these patients like suffering? Like there has to be a better way. And so I just, I started studying functional medicine. I started studying regenerative medicine and I just got so involved. Mm. And like when I was in, in med school, like I was reading textbooks on like integrative mm. medicine, functional medicine, and like regen stuff. And like, well, and on top of everything else. And so that way I kind of understood both perspectives, but obviously I saw a gap because like, I'm like, why isn't this stuff being applied clinically? Um, and then, so that's how I got yeah. to the whole regen stuff because it was really just to help more people. And like, it's been like super rewarding to help millions of people or not millions of people yet, but with our technology, we'll help millions of people because now we have some proprietary stem cell tech. Um, but it's been really rewarding to help a lot of people around the world. So um, not just, you know, like the Kings and rulers over here, but all over, but just like the regular people too. That's so cool. Okay. Um, what, what's your thoughts on, so implementable things that people can do that aren't these expensive infusions, you said muscle, um, muscle, maybe light therapy can help a little bit. Um, what else is there? Can, well, what, what, think, what can re the regular person do? Yeah, for no, like find, find, find a proper nutrition, like protocol for your body. Like yeah. people, people, there's so much bad information about nutrition and like, I can, I can go, I could probably talk like two hours just about nutrition and how to, but like, there's like two overarching themes I can give people. Uh, one is using a continuous glucose monitor to identify how your body responds to different foods. Um, because like I could eat a banana and you could eat a banana and we could have two completely different responses. And that that can tell you, mm -hmm. because if my blood sugar is going up crazy and yours is stable, then obviously I shouldn't be eating bananas because that high glucose is going to trigger more insulin, which is going to trigger inflammation, which is going to cause issues. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is um, using blood work and laboratory markers. And there are so many different inflammatory markers you can do to figure out like, how is your body responding to different nutritional programs? Like there's something called, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so what that means, there's SNPs and even like the LDL cholesterol. So if I eat a hot fat, oh. if I eat a high fat diet, it could cause me no issues. Um, and my cholesterol stays good. My LDL cholesterol stays good. The oxidative stress, inflammation all stays good. But someone like you or, you know, just so you eat a high fat diet and your, your cholesterol goes through the roof and you have all this inflammation going on in your body. So those are called SNPs. So there's a lot of individualization to this stuff. And um, the best test out there is uh, at least I've seen this called DNA Co. Um, it's developed by like um, one of the smartest geneticists in the world. And he uses functional genomics to identify what type of nutrition and uh, program you should make for your body. Oh, maybe I'll do that. Yeah. And be like vegan. Yeah. yeah just I think that, <laughs> Gosh, if Khan is the fan, he's yeah, he's a smart guy. He was just, he's all over the world speaking and stuff. It's a really cool technology. Cool. Okay. Wow. Very interesting. Well, what else do I have on here? Are there any other tricks that we haven't delved into? Because I brought up NAD and hyperbaric, and you said you guys kind of like poke around in there too. But yeah. like, what else do you do? Uh, I think the big, the, <laughs> I think the big, um, there's no big secret. I mean, if IV stem cells, I think, are the big secret, and we've revealed that obviously, and how people can get access to that stuff. But like, I think the big thing a lot of people forget about really is like, um, you know, meditation, like meaning and purpose, that type of stuff. Because like, if you're not like that stuff is so important, it doesn't matter how much you invest into all this other stuff. But if you don't have like a good reason as to like, why you're like, why you're living, what what's your big, bigger purpose? Um, and you don't have that like relaxation response when you meditate, um, you're never going to truly like be optimizing your health. And, uh, you know, you can throw as many tricks and stuff as you want, but that's like the base of the pyramid, in my opinion. And uh, there's a lot of like tricksters out there who are going to tell you to like buy this program, sell this and do that. But you should focus on the fundamentals first and then worry about the, you know, superfluous stuff after. Um, but yeah, I think that's like, I, I can't overemphasize like the importance of meditation. Like they're just so like, I'm sure everyone already knows, but it's just something to reiterate, like having like a routine of mindfulness that's like you practice regularly. Um, that's so important. Yeah, I've fallen away a little bit from that. I was really into it, like when all my symptoms went away and everything in 2018, I was like, whoa, okay, I'm gonna do everything. And I like, everything was dialed. And then when mom and dad got sick, it was like survival mode for two yeah. and a half years. So it was like, yeah, I'm not like, I'm not even going, even though meditation would benefit me now, it was like, if all you're thinking about are scary things, it was like, I'm not meditating. My sleep schedule got out of whack. Everything got out of whack. Things are a lot better now. Like things are great now, yeah. but like 
I'm like, I've gotten to the point in work that I haven't been prioritizing. I mean, I will. It'll probably take me another month because I've been talking about it and then I'll just do I'll it. You this, but like, I have to go back I'll to like meditating. My, there's, there's this one video on YouTube. It's a 10, it's a 10 minute guided one by this like um, Indian guru guy or someone and he's just like it's like the most relaxing thing I've ever fa found and but it's like so and it's just the way he does it and he always talks about how the spine is the center um because like in different cultures like there's like chakra there's chi like in different like you know China Japan and India there's like Sits they all talk about this the, the spine being the center and he just it's a really cool guided meditation so but that's okay that's yeah he wants to do. send that well what do you think about um saunas and cold plunges and breathing techniques yeah so like saunas definitely have like because of especially out of finland there's like a lot of data from um there in terms of like health benefits um and a cold plunge like i'm i'm still like a little bit skeptical about because i don't know if it really has real health benefits as opposed to more just like maybe mental health benefits like just like telling your body like i'm gonna do this now and I don't care how you just like and just like get your sympathetic nervous system going and like kind of telling your body when you need to go you go type of thing you know what I mean um and being able to control your body's response in that sense I think has put some potential benefits um but from like actually like reducing inflammation in terms of long-term data or anything like that like I don't think there's I don't I haven't seen much on it um and um yeah so I think for like cold plunges and sauna like I, if i if i if you could like if everyone could have access to sauna it is a great thing to have in your house or have on a daily basis because there's again there's a lot of upside and little downside so i i like i'm i definitely a fan of that i like cold plunges more than i thought i would there's this there's this like weird little place in dubai that one of my friends brought me to and it was like i showed up on the street and it's in the backyard and you have to go through this sketchy gate and there were just like tubs almost like garbage, like tubs full of ice. And I was like, this is, this seems like a bad idea. But they had like saunas set up and an area for Wim Hof breathing and um, cold plunges. And I think after Wim Hof breathing, after saunaing and Wim Hof breathing, maybe it's because you're on the verge of passing out. I don't know. But I, that like constant narrative voice in my head just wasn't there. I remember like looking at the sky and being and the first thought was like, oh, that's like some people don't have an internal dialogue. Yeah. And I was like, that is so much better. Like I could hear without thinking about hearing it was super strange. So that happened after Wim Hof breathing. And I feel like the same thing happens with um, sitting in an ice bath, which is just like if you control your breathing and sit in there, then it's just like no internal dialogue. But it's great. That's how yeah. I felt about it anyway. No, that, and I think that that's exactly what you said is the key is like using the breathing component to get the maximum benefits out of the cold uh, treatments and like oh for sure like you, Patrick McEwen have you heard of he's like the he's like the guy who wrote a book um, about breathing and like that's by far the best resource about breathing and like how to breathe and why breathing so important and everything um, but like yeah hmm. breath, like breathing is like one of those things that should be taught to like preschoolers like it's so fundamental and it's just, yeah. it's just silly that it's not in our education system at this point like you it, people don't know how to breathe like it's just it's just it's kind of funny but also sad at the same time my mom came into my grade two class as just like a guest speaker and tried to teach uh she did hatha yoga for a long time but she tried to teach a bunch of us how to breathe I just remember I was so embarrassed <laughs> well. she was she, like she was making a thing of it but she was trying to teach people to, like instead of breathing up into your shoulders yeah. to like breathe, breathe out. That's what she was teaching. Yeah. I was just like, that's so fundamental. Like, so but back then, yeah, well, back then it was like, and I mean, there was not much concept of this whole, um, no all this stuff, but like now it's like, they're trying to incorporate it, but it should be literally like a curriculum that they're taught. So, um, that, and like, you know, just that's like, a good idea. I always think about like the lack of how ill prepared people are to manage their health after going through 12 years of school or whatever, 16 years of school, whatever. Uh, it depends how much school you do. I did like 20 years of school, so <laughs> just, but it's, uh, yeah. but basically the point is like, there should be, it should be built into our system about like how to educate people to empower them on health, right? Like how to, how to move properly, how to breathe properly, how to eat properly. Yeah. Like these are just like, like it's, just, it's just fundamental, right? Like empower people to be like, take care of their own health instead of like relying on a system that's just broken. Like, I mean, if you're from, you're from Canada originally, so you know how bad our system is in Ontario right now, right? Like mm. it's really bad. So it's, and it's right, not, right now. Yeah. It's getting worse. Like the emergency it, wait times, like access to care, 
everything is just like broken. Like it's just, yeah. It's yeah. It, it's angering. I was there. Um, I didn't go back. So I moved like a year and a half ago, and I didn't go back for a long time. Um, especially there's a travel ban kind of on, and um. Anyway, I, I went back in October and Scarlett got a wicked cough. And so I was trying to search for some cough medicine. And there's this company, um, Genexa, that okay. I really like yeah. for kids. Yeah. So if, if people need like kids, and I, I, they might do stuff for adults too, but their ingredients, they just have like acetaminophen, some like agave mm -hmm. nectar to make it sweet. There's like no dyes and yeah. sketchy things. So anyway, good luck finding that in Canada. Yeah. But she was you really sick and she wasn't going to sleep. Yeah, so so that was out. So I was just trying to find cough medicine because she wasn't going to sleep all night. Um, and everywhere was out of cough medicine. Like everywhere in Toronto didn't have cough medicine. Yeah, we're I was we're like like, a third like world country. communist shelves. Yeah, <laughs> we, I, I've seen our healthcare system uh, basically go from like top tier to uh, third world country in the span of a couple of years. It's kind of it's very sad. Uh, I do have a meeting with Doug Ford, um, who's our premier. I had I had a call with him before I left, and I have another. I'm meeting him again, and when I go back, um, I'm not sure if I can push the envelope. I'm not really interested in politics, but at least he, I, at least I have his ear and the Ministry of Health to at least like give them some guidance on how to fix their system. And um, from a high level, I think it's just there's there's so much. But I think from a high level, it's just you have to restructure the way physicians are incentivized. Like right now, it's just a it's a reactive system. You don't get paid unless people are sick. And you don't get paid unless you see a lot of people. So unless you change that whole fundamental system, it's, it's never going to really, you know, change. Well, that's that's great. Good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I'm not hopeful. I'm not hopeful. <laughs> that that, but, that's, no, that China, would be great. But, I know. But, you know, in parts of China, they actually incent, they actually pay you, they give you bonuses if your patients don't go to the hospital or if your patients don't get sick. Like they, there's actually parts of China like that. So it's like, you know, it's oh, I not didn't like, know that. you don't, it's not like you have to reinvent the wheel. Like there are people who are doing it. It's just the, obviously like it's, the system was designed um, by people who wanted to support basically surgery and pharmaceuticals, not preventative care. Right. So. Wow. I didn't know that about China. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. You should be paid like a bonus if you get your patient better. Exactly. That should be the bonus. Yeah. Or if they stay out of hospital or if they don't get cancer or if they, they don't get heart. Like there's so many different metrics you could have like outcomes to like incentivize family doctors to keep their patients healthy, you know, but there's no, there's literally zero. So why is a, why is a family doctor going to spend an extra 10, 20, 30 minutes with you? They'd rather just get in and get out. Right. And that's the only way they can make money. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what are the worst things you can do for yourself to increase how fast you age? Uh, stress is probably the most common that people don't realize. Perfect. It's, it's like over, like, especially in our modern environment and everything. Um, and then sleep is another big one. Um, it's not just about quantity, right? We know it's the quality as well. And there's so many different ways you can track that now. But uh, I think that's, if you're not getting enough sleep and you're stressed, your body's just going to age so much faster. And you can see it on people's faces and all that stuff too. Um, they just, they just age. Right. And, um, I think glycation is another big one, which is where those like, uh, glucose or sugar molecules attach to like the red blood cells. Um, so eating refined high sugar processed diets are going to age you really fast too. Uh, and like, it's very basic stuff, but like a lot of people still don't understand because there's so much bad information out there and there's still so much industry that promotes sugar in like subverts way, subverts way, like where people don't really understand that this has sugar in it. Um, like most people obviously know mm -hmm. like about common things, but a lot of people don't realize how, a, what a simple carbohydrate is and how your body processes that and all that stuff. Right. So, um, but glycation is like a huge thing because it just ages your body internally. Um, and uh, like, I, yeah, I process foods and the whole food industry. It's, it's I always say it's, it's funny, like the food industry and the, so the three industries that all have the same playbook are the tobacco industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the food industry. They, they've all done the same things over the last 60 years. So the tobacco industry did it first, right, in the 60s. They got doctors. Their doctors used to smoke. They used to say it's good for you. And then 20 years later, they're like, oh, wait, we're wrong about that. And then pharmaceuticals done the same Really wrong. Thing. And then the sugar the sugar and food industry have done the same thing. So you always get doctors to buy in, promote it. Blah, blah, blah. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, wait. Like, and, it, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's funny. If you just study the history a little bit, you see that they all do the same tactics. 
Yeah, it's a crazy tactic too. It's like, oh, we were wrong. Sorry, a bunch of you died. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's yeah, and that's where like as a doctor, like our job is to be able to, like, you should be able to like discern like what's you know really the truth. But for some reason, like a lot, of, I guess a lot of doctors just stop caring. But I don't know. Or they're worried um, because of their colleges. I mean, d- Dad's college is going after him right now. Are you, aren't you concerned? I mean, you're you're in Dubai, and you said you're in Mexico. But you're not concerned about being too cutting edge and losing your license or having your college at least investigate you? Yeah, I mean, it's, you, it, it happened during COVID because I was making, I wasn't making anti, I never made an anti vax post, but I was just making posts about like how we should be more nuanced about the vaccine because there is, it's like any other prescription, like it doesn't necessarily have to be for everyone at any age, like maybe someone who's 18 and healthy doesn't necessarily need the vaccine, like maybe the risks outweigh the benefits. Um, And like, I got a call from the college about that. And I was like, okay, this is very interesting. Uh, So uh, it's yeah, it's crazy. Like, and then so obviously, I had to stop talking about it. Um, And yeah, for sure, with the regen stuff, I think there could be some issues potentially, because it is very cutting edge and you are taking away care. I mean, you are taking away business from big hospitals and um, there's going to be pushback and there's already a lot of pushback, especially because I'm, I'm relatively high profile now and I'm treating and traveling around the world and treating a lot of high profile people and there's just going to be more eyes on you. But I think I'm doing it with good science and I'm working. It's not like I'm working like I'm working with big institute. I'm working with like a Harvard scientist and a University of Toronto scientist. I'm working with a scientist from Italy and Dubai. Like it's not like I'm working with like some random bum, you know, like I have good institutions backing me. And I think the institutional stuff really adds a layer of credibility that the college wouldn't be able to come after me. Um, and that's why I, I, I believe like I'm fine. I'm actually in good science and I have good names to back me up. So I'm not overly worried. And to be honest, like my move is going to be based out of Florida anyway, over the next six months and like sweet Miami yeah Miami yeah Fort Lauderdale so I'll be there um because Canada's just like the innovation is so slow and there's just not nearly as much opportunity for business um so I'm just like you know I gotta and and Dubai is the same thing right there's so much innovation going on here and I've had like I've literally had more business opportunities here because I have a few companies and like in the last two weeks than I did in like two years in Canada so it's just like there's just so much more going on yeah Dubai was weird um when I I so I spent Two months, I think, in Dubai in 2021. And it, the opportunities are crazy. Like anybody, everybody there is an entrepreneur, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That have just congregated there. So you're like, you want to start a business? Yeah, sure. And it's like, what? Yeah. That does, then you don't have those conversations. I mean, Miami's pretty entrepreneurial. Miami's weird, though. It's kind of like Caribbean slash entrepreneurial. Um, but Canada, it was hard to find other people. Like a lot of the yeah. people who were, who felt like that just moved. Exactly. There's a brain dump, right? And like a lot of the smart people I know are just leaving. Um, and it's just, it's unfortunate because you're Canadian as well, right? And so you obviously want to see your country do well, but it's uh, it's sad to see it uh, go the other way. And unless the laws change, it's going to keep happening. Like, um, like one of our, like our new company, our regen company that we have our proprietary stem cell, like we're going to probably situate our headquarters in like Austin or something, you know what I mean? Like we're, there's just so much going on in Austin. There's just so much, like there's so many like intelligent people and entrepreneurs and stuff. Um, and, but a lot of them are from Canada are just leaving and going to places like Austin. Yeah. It's too bad. I'm annoyed. I really like Toronto and I think it's just going to get like worse, worse yeah, way worse. Yeah. Like that's what it looks like. So the government, it's right? It's bad government and bad regulators. And um, they're, yeah, they, it's, I don't know if it's like, I always wonder, I'm like, are they are they evil or are they stupid? Like, it's, it's hard to know. Well, Justin Trudeau might be evil and stupid, but he's definitely not that bright. Yeah. Like he, he's not, otherwise he w- like would have been doing something bright before he got into politics, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and uh, Doug Ford is you know, Doug Ford. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll see. At least, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks. Um, okay. Where can people find you online if they want to uh, learn more? Yeah, my, I'm very active on Instagram. It's at dr.acon, K-H-A-N, so Dr. Akon. And uh, I try my best to check my DMs. I get a ridiculous amount, but uh, I, I do... 
I do believe in it because like I have been just because I check my DM like if like you know I because I check them pretty regularly like I've been able to change some people's lives and like if I didn't check my DM like they would have never got better um so I do take it seriously from that perspective as much as like it's hard to keep up but sometimes um so don't like and like now with the scope of stem cells expanding like there might be hope for people who otherwise had lost hope um so hopefully it'd be like and like yes cost can be an issue obviously sometimes but um we've also we we're starting a program for people like like hardship pricing and like you know be able to treatments for free and stuff like that if you're on disability like we're we're trying to our best to help as many people as we can because i think that at the end of the day is like uh my mission at least yeah yeah no that's really nice and i mean w when things are new they're expensive when they're new and rare they're expensive so is understandable that it's gonna cost a lot now and that it'll get cheaper and that's just kind of how things work. Yeah, unfortunately, which is why takes it, time. It's a great uh, business opportunity and that's why we're in the in the space now for manufacturing, yes. Yeah, cool, okay. Well, I'll link your social media handle and a couple of things we talked about below in the show notes, but thank you very much for coming on. That was very interesting. Yeah, no, I'll see you in Mexico. <laughs>